Now that you have some idea of March's logics and passing references to culture, coalitions, and anarchic decision environments, we can turn to Allison's study of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Why, why the Cuban Missile Crisis? It's clearly a policy environment, um, but it has lots of nice qualities applicable to nonprofits and government organizations. In fact, crisis management is common in, in many organizations. And in many instances, the stakes of policies and decisions are enormous. Take, for example, in the United States, we have No Child Left Behind as this massive uh, policy effort in education that creates crises in schools uh, and whether they get money. Uh, take, for example, harassment and grievance claims within organizations, uh, suicides and deaths within organizations. In these circumstances, what do you do? How can you describe what happened and how people reacted and whether people followed some kind of a reasonable procedure? How can we successfully manage in those situations? And here we have kind of a wonderful example of a Cuban Missile Crisis uh, that's been well laid out by Graham Allison uh, for us to begin this kind of conversation. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a huge event. It was arguably the closest we came to World War III when well over 100 million people could have died. In fact, John Kennedy, the president at the time in the United States, is quoted as, as estimating the chance of failure in that event as one in three or even one in two. It's a little too close for comfort for most of us. Um, because of this, analysts want to understand how national governments and their organizations maneuver crises. Um, they want to get a better sense for how to prevent disasters in the future and to possibly manage these crises better. Let me give a brief summary of the Cuban Missile Crisis in case anyone is unfamiliar with it. The events that we're going to discuss occurred back in 1962, and it led the United States to be in its highest state of war readiness ever, and the Soviet field commanders were prepared to use battlefield nuclear weapons to defend Cuba if invaded. Fortunately, war was averted. A little context may help you though. Um, back in 1962, the Soviet missiles could only reach Europe, while US missiles could reach the entire Soviet Union. So this was a, a time of advantage for the United States. Uh, and upon meeting with Kennedy at a summit, the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev walked away thinking somewhat little of, of Kennedy as a statesman and thought that he might have the upper hand in some kind of encounter. So in April 1962, Khrushchev started thinking that the placement of intermediate range missiles in Cuba could deter a potential U.S. attack against the Soviet Union and serve their interests uh, of detente, right? Um, Fidel Castro, on the other hand, uh, in Cuba was worried the U.S. would attack again after it failed uh, to do so in the Bay of Pigs in 1971. Um, uh, Fidel approved Khrushchev's plan to place missiles on the island and saw them as a deterrent to a U.S. invasion of Cuba. So the two sides kind of agreed uh, to have this uh, happen. In the summer of 1962, the Soviet Union began to secretly build uh, its missiles uh, and installations in Cuba. The crisis for the United States began around October 15, 1962, when US uh, U-2 reconnaissance planes photographed Soviet missiles under construction in Cuba. And they looked, the, the planes are as follows, and the kind of reconnaissance photos uh, look like the ones uh, on the screen now. At the time, uh, when President Kennedy was informed of these installations, he convened what was called the XCOM, uh, a group of his 12 most important advisors. And XCOM met for uh, a bunch of days, uh, seven days, and Kennedy decided to impose a naval quarantine around Cuba in these meetings. Um, quite a few key actors were in this group, uh, from Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, Dean Rusk, the U.S. Secretary of State, George Ball, who was the Under Secretary of State, John McCone, George, McGeorge Bundy, the National Security Advisor, um, and Robert McNamara, very important figure who was pretty domineering in the meetings, was the Secretary of Defense, uh, and then Llewellyn Thompson, an ambassador at large, uh, the former U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, who's the only Russian expert on that committee. On October 22nd, Kennedy announced the discovery of the missile installations to the public and his decision to quarantine the island. And here you see the letter that he wrote uh, to Khrushchev announcing his uh, being upset about uh, the, the state of events. 
On October 23rd, Kennedy orders the quarantine to actually occur, the blockade against Cuba. Um, he also proclaimed that any nuclear missile launched from Cuba would be regarded as an attack on the United States by the Soviet Union, and he demanded that the Soviets remove all of their offensive weapons from Cuba. And as you'll see here, you can see the blockade, Kennedy signing that act, and then the, the planes on the tarmac uh, are spread out in case of a, a counterattack or some kind of attack uh, on the United States and Florida uh, that, that bombs would, would not hit all the planes at once. On October 23rd, Khrushchev wrote Kennedy stating that the quarantine constituted an act of aggression, propelling humankind into the abyss of a world nuclear missile war. On the 24th, uh, Russian vessels uh, turned away from the blockade, so they saw eyeball to eyeball, as Dean Rusk said. Um, and then on the 25th, the blockade was pulled out further to sea because uh, Kennedy and, and his naval uh, commanders were worried about mistakes and boarding any craft that might uh, trigger a nuclear war. So tensions were pretty high and, uh, you know, Kennedy raised military readiness to DEFCON 2 on the 25th. On the 26th, XCOM received a letter from Khrushchev proposing the removal of Soviet missiles and personnel if the U.S. could guarantee they would not invade Cuba. On October 27th, a U-2 plane was shot down over Cuba and the XCOM received a second letter from Khrushchev demanding the removal of U.S. missiles in Turkey in exchange for Soviet missiles in Cuba. At this point, uh, the Trollope ploy was, was done, which is the United States responded to the first letter, accepting the conditions, and both sides largely agreed to this. Um, so it was kind of a, an interesting ploy um, and deal of compromise and trying to, to get advantage of the situation. On October 28th, tensions eased a bit when Khrushchev publicly announced that he would dismantle the installations and return the missiles to the Soviet Union and he expressed his trust that the United States would not invade Cuba. Further negotiations arose to implement the October 28th agreement and during that time the US secretly removed missiles from Turkey. And here you see photos of, of the actual uh, uh, effort to kind of uh, observe and record the actual removal of the missiles and what that was actually occurring.